The last lecture, we once again looked at the ways in which the monarchy in Russia was deteriorating conditions uh, within Russia on a social level um, were deteriorating. And we had all these revolutionary groups that we had coming from the past back in 1905, right? So 1917 becomes really pivotal, really crucial. Early March 1917, there was demonstrations and food riots breaking out in the capital. And I, I would say that probably a lot of these people who were protesting were really demonstrating against, you know, not having food. So, you know, many of you here might think, oh, I'm not even a very political person. I don't care about, you know, all that crap and, you know, going in the streets, like, you know, parading around rather a Tea Party member or some weird ass hippie or whatever, you know, it's like, but you know, when you got no food, if you got no food and you see a group of people out there going, we need some freaking food, then you're going to go out there, right? Like, I don't care who you are. And so you had those elements. And then, the rabble rousers are obviously going to take advantage of the fact that you just have a bunch of pissed off people in the streets. And they're going to say, hey, come this way. We've been pissed. Let, you know, come with us. And so this is where you get kind of a revolutionary fervor going. Um, and the city's garrison refused to suppress. What does that mean? Soldiers were feeling more in common with the common people than they were with the, their superiors or the the you know, the chain of command. And so soldiers were just siding with the people often, okay? In certain cases, there were stories of the military shooting cops, you know, Russian police officers siding with the people. So that's when you really have a demoralized regime, right? Uh, I mean, if, if Obama or Bush or anybody sent in military to squash an uprising and the military shot the police officers and sided with the people, we'd be like, whoa, that's when you know things have really, you know, that there's something amiss here, uh, right? So within a few days, the Tsar abdicated, stepped down, and then a provincial government was set up. Okay, and... Um, the socialists played just a little role. Most were in exile or in prison at the time. So that's something to keep in mind. But this time period really set things in motion like, you know, the cat's out of the bag or Pandora's box is open and a lot of things that are, a movement is now taking place that's going to prevent things from ever going back to normal. Alexander Kerensky recruits uh, is recruited to the second uh, prime minister of the Russian provincial government, and you have many of these men who are taking it would be maybe considered leftist, but again not revolutionary. So there's an attempt by reformers, people that really want to just simply see the system get corrected itself. They're not looking for a total overthrow of the government. But within the system, I mean, as we read um, in the Communist Manifesto, there's a specter haunting Europe. It's a specter of communism. You had certain hardliners that believed that the only way to make society better was to completely overturn the old order. And so, in fact, this isn't going to be far enough, in other words, for those kind of revolutionaries. And one revolutionary to come back to really articulate a revolutionary vision and to really just attack all of his opponents with quite a bit of wit and intellect is the return of Lenin from exile. Now, um, I think that really, in my personal opinion, Lenin should be given the most credit or, uh, you know, positive or negative, however you take um you know, the communist legacy as the man who sets in the mo into motion uh, a communist state. Karl Marx, I mean, and I'm not the only one to actually make this illustration, by the way. I read this once. Um, if you could say Karl Marx is kind of like Jesus in the sense that Jesus, if you look, if you read the gospel accounts, Jesus doesn't have a lot of rules. He doesn't set up 
a lot of organizational structural matters about you know what it would mean to be someone who follows Jesus he kind of gives you like the a message right but if you look at Paul if you read the other New Testament writings it's Paul who really sets up the church that's secular historians agree to that and many um, theologians as well and if you just read the Bible you see that that most of Christianity excuse me as it seemed to be you know coming directly from Jesus the church structure and the hierarchy or the ways that the church is structured and its rules and, and all this kind of stuff seem to come from more or less like the writings of Paul in the New Testament and certainly not so much from the writings of Jesus um, because he didn't even write anything you know um, the, the gospel stories are you know writing about it but anyhow not to lose you too much on that but just to say that Karl Marx created an idea and Lenin implemented it in a politically structured way. And he was not like Karl Marx, who was a German. Karl Marx was a German philosopher, man. He was working with the ideal, idealist tradition in Germany, meaning that they just, they're not easy to read. The Communist Manifesto is relatively easy to follow. Just start reading Karl Marx's other writings, man. I, I guarantee you that probably a lot of uh, uh, communists didn't read much of Karl Marx's other writings. He's not easy to follow. He's not because he writes in that tradition of the German philosophers. Engels was a little more clear and concise. But Lenin, if, if you, you know, I gave you a little section of, of you to read of him. Man, he just really just knows how to articulate and motivate you should not underestimate him and I really think it's kind of a disservice to history that so many people who study political science and history are not exposed to Lenin's writings again you may think he's the worst person ever but he's very significant and you when you look into his works you see why this man was able to uh, uh, create such international appeal eventually okay but having said that um, there's a documentary that um, I have linked to this and you know you guys have been watching a lot of documentaries I'm gonna actually post this this used to be able to just draw out my link but it's this called biography the great Vladimir Lenin voice of revolution and, and it doesn't betray him necessarily is always so great but it will definitely give you an idea a little bit more about him which then expands the ideas of what really happens in Russia the way he's able to utilize um, his organizational uh, abilities and how Russia was going to <clears throat> have a full-on revolution the first of its kind um, uh, uh, to really try the alternative system of, 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 of a communism some alternative to capitalist industrialization and so we'll be exploring more or less uh, as we go through the different chapters about the topic of the Russian Revolution and what it means I mean what it, you know what it meant uh, to people at the time and so forth so I will end up posting this <clears throat> documentary and I hope that was clear enough any more questions send them my way